I'm not really one for vlogging videos, so I'll try and keep this as non nice daddy as possible. But um, I've been living in Bristol for about two years now, and I've never actually done a video about how Bristol came to be the city that it is known as today. It's a very, very interesting story, and it can be basically summed up in one word, and that word is slavery. Now, if you're not aware, Britain was part of the triangular slave trade back in the 16-1700s. They brought in acts to repeal that in 1807, but they didn't go entirely according to plan. We'll get to those later. Now, Bristol, along with Liverpool and London, were some of the biggest exporters in the slave trade. And whilst Bristol wasn't necessarily the biggest of the free, like Liverpool especially, it definitely was instrumental in opening up new avenues for the future of the slave trade to export. Now the reason I'm on location today is basically because as well as talking about slave history I really want to talk mainly about the slave owners and whilst many of them of course did live in the Caribbean on the plantations about 70 of them did live in Bristol and today that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be going to some of the houses where these slave owners used to live now of course they don't live there anymore please if you know these places in real life do not go up and egg them I don't want this to be an advocacy of violence okay? Now what a lot of people don't know about the slave trade is that when it finally came to an end, many of the people involved in the trade were actually compensated for their losses, somewhere in the region of about 20 million pounds, which today is a lot, a lot of money. Now many of the slave traders actually lived here in Clifton. Clifton is basically Bristol's answer to Chelsea or the Upper East Side. And um, just around the corner is one of the most famous houses from that period. So let's go take a look. So this is Two Litfield Place, and it was owned originally by a guy called Charles T. Allenay. Now he owned about 800 slaves, and he received in compensation for that about 18,000 pounds. Now old money conversion for 1834 is about 100, 110 times the amount it is today. So in upwards then, it was basically around two million pounds he received, as you can see. It's a pretty swanky house. So just around the corner then we get to Four Saville Place. Now this place was owned by a guy called Thomas Healy and he owned about in the upwards of about 250 slaves back in 1834. He got about five grand in compensation so not as much but still quite a bit. So that was quite funny. I just bumped into some people who lived in the house that I was next going to uh, show you guys. That's called 17 Bellevue, and that was owned by the Hepburns, William Hepburn. Hepburn, of course, was a very affluent name, historically. And uh, they didn't own many by comparison. They only owned about 80 slaves, but they still got about two grand in old money. So, again, they still got quite a lot. And the slaves, they got nothing. They had to work for another four years after they'd given up their slaves in order to pay for their freedom. Of course, when they got freedom, most of them just worked on the plantations the same way they had for hundreds of years. When we think of the slave trade, it's easy to think of these huge, lavish houses that they lived in with big, big tracts of land. But the reality is when they uncovered the documents and they analysed them about the compensation claims and so on, what they found was that a huge, huge amount of them were middle class people. Doctors, lawyers, all that kind of sorts. They weren't people who lived in massive houses or went to huge balls. No, they were just, well, some would say, ordinary folks. Here's just one example. Right here is a place called Seven Meridian Place, and this was owned by John and Mary Tucker. Now, they owned about 15 slaves, and they got compensated about £300 for their slaves. So it's not very much, but it just goes to show slavery wasn't just for the super rich. You know, it was owned by fairly relatively ordinary people by comparison and you know, slavery was a pretty ordinary thing if you had a bit of money in your pockets this was people who just had ordinary jobs and they happened to own slaves so this is quite interesting i just found there's a mr whippy van behind me now little known fact but some mr whippy vans actually run today on modern day slavery. There's an article in the Bristol Cable about this, but yeah, some of them pay them as little as one pound an hour to work, and they're basically just foreign laborers who are broked in because they can't get work anywhere else. So obviously not all of them, I'm not demonizing every single Mr. Whiffy van, but just so you're aware, some of these places are really, really dodgy. Slavery was not just ideological. We are not taught anywhere near the right amount of how integral slavery was to early modern society. So when you've got the slaves, you've also got to feed them. So what do you feed them with quite cheaply and effectively? Well, herring is quite good for that. Where do you get herring from? You get herring from Bridgewater. So now part of Bridgewater's economy becomes part of the slave trade. Now, as well as that, you've also got to get ships to uh, send them off to Africa and then America. So where do you get that from? Well, Bristol's a great harbour city. And so now the shipbuilders become part of the slave trade as well. 
when you look at it like this and you extend it further and further and further it's really easy to see just why so many people at the time were not interested in getting rid of slavery because to them at the time it's a very very profitable industry with a lot of money to be made you as a capitalist of any part whether you're a butcher baker or candlestick maker you don't want to lose out on that wealth and it's also just really easy to see when you relate this to today's world why so many people don't want to pay their staff higher wages, don't want to get rid of sweatshops and so forth. You see all these crazy arguments being put forth, but the reason why, at the end of the day, is because it's profitable. And the same extends for slavery. And because this was the status quo at the time, it's very easy to see then why many slave owners were good to their slaves. Because they didn't see it as some ideological thing of just, you know, being a maniacal dictator. Many of them just saw it as profit-making. It's the status quo. Someone's got to do it. It might as well be me. I might be a bit nicer to my slaves. Moving on further down, we get to Free York Place. This place was owned by a guy called Reverend Robert Alwood. Now, that might sound like a strange title, but yeah, reverends were just as part of the slave trade as anybody else was. And they would be blessing the name of the Lord in their congregations every Sunday, whilst every year they'd be accepting the profits that their slaves made. A bit further up we get to Five and Six York Place. These places of course weren't what they were in 1834, but this was owned by Anne Trotman and her daughter Junior. They got a similar amount. It's very strange actually, when they uh, looked at the records they found that 40% of the slave owners were women. And you might think, oh well that just proves that women had the same rights as men back then. No, no, it's because they're widows. Uh, they live longer than men of course, they don't go out as much back then, and of course because of that they just accept the slaves that their husbands left behind. And as we go further down then, we get to One York Place, very fitting name. Sarah Johnson owned one slave, £1,500. Another widow and another middle class slave owner. I'm now here in Queen Square, and whilst this isn't in Clifton, this was right next to the harbour. And in many ways it was where the epicentre of the slave traders lived. I mean, just about everybody who used to live here was in some way connected to the slave trade. This was basically made as a Georgian renaissance to get away from the hustle and bustle of the Tudor life in the cities. Now whilst there were many slave owners who lived here, from what the records say at least, not many of them appeared to be compensated. There was a guy here called James Cunningham and he owned about 2,000 slaves and he received compensation. But over here at 49 Queen Square, there was a very interesting case of a guy called John Phipps Hood. He owned about 18 slaves, so he was quite a small slaver, but unfortunately he didn't actually receive any compensation claims. From what I am aware, the proceeds may have gone to his wife after he died. So we've got to ask ourselves then, why is it that slavery finally came to an end? Now, it's easy to point to the abolitionists and the reformers and think that they were the prime movers and all this, and you know, in some ways they did a lot of good, and we think it's quite cool because it makes us think you know, we, we got rid of slavery without having to go into a war or anything like that. And they did a lot of good, you know, they, they brought about reforms that allowed uh, less slaves to be put onto ships, resulting in less cramped conditions, reforms like that. Does this sound familiar to any of you? Um, but when it comes down to it, nothing beats economics. And the slave trade, just like just about any, anything else in the world, the main reason why it came to an end was because of economics. In 1791 there was a big uprising in Haiti and it basically brought an end to the slave societies there. The, basically the slaves rose up and they came above their colonizers. And then in Jamaica, Britain's colony, they had another uprising. It didn't succeed, but they definitely scared all the slave owners in the country. And um, again, similar things were happening all around the world, like slavery was just becoming less and less profitable as time went on. Remember, we weren't really that big of friends with America at the time, and we just lost loads and loads of our slave uh, plantations in the South of America uh, because of, well, we went to a war with them, of course. And so this, among with many other things, just sort of led to this idea that slavery is just not becoming a worthwhile thing to do anymore. We're entering a new age, we're entering a sort of industrial age, and we don't really need to rely on owning people anymore. It's far better to rent them, really. So it was in 1807 that the first Slave Abolition Acts were implemented, but that just stopped the trade. The actual process of owning and managing slaves and making profit off of them, will that still continue? We all like to stop there, but no, unfortunately not. And it would stay that way for another three decades when the government finally said, OK, we can't do this anymore, slavery has to end. But the problem there then is you've got a lot of people 
who are very vital to your economy and you've just taken away the one thing by which they can secure their profits. And this is where the compensation claims came in. The government gathered together an enormous amount of money through either borrowing or taxes or so forth and they put it all together and they distributed it out to 46,000 slave owners at the time. And all that money together basically went towards building the Industrial Revolution. Slavery, of course, hasn't ended, it's just gone underground. It's still done where people can find profit in doing so. And if you go to places like Dagestan or parts of India, you will still find today Monday slaves working for free or for the pursuit of profit. And, you know, people tolerate it because it makes them money. Now, you're probably wondering who was the wealthiest slave owner in the entire of Bristol. Well, that honour goes to a man called Thomas Daniel. Thomas Daniel lived in Berkeley Square, which is opposite the Wills Memorial Building at the top of Park Street, which is a very famous street in Bristol. Now, he owned so many slaves that he was called the King of Bristol. 8,000 slaves, estimate. And he received about, in estimates, of around £20 million in compensation. Now, that was the wealthiest in Bristol, but not in the entire of England. In the entire of England, the wealthiest family were the Gladstone family. They received £80 million in today's money. Now, when you get to figures like that, you just can't help but realise that the entirety of what we have today, all this machinery, all this progress, all this conquest, it was really driven in part by slavery and definitely by these compensation claims that the owners received, not the slaves. So now to finish off with, I'm here at the tobacco factory in Southville, and this is basically the first point that sparked my interest in the slave trade in Bristol. I was here filming a 5x15 talk with David Olasuga, who did a documentary about how Britain had its role in the slave trade. Of course, the great irony of having a tobacco factory here is that tobacco is not a tropical fruit. You can see it grown in many places in America, and you don't have to grow it in the equator. It can be grown in England, in many parts of the country. But during the slave trade, all of our tobacco came from the colonies and the reason why is because they had a monopoly and they wanted to keep it that way. So that's pretty much the end of the tour, thanks for sticking around. Now if you're wondering where I got all the facts and figures for this video, uh, you can basically go onto a site called the Legacies of the Slave Trade at uh, University College London. You can actually type in your name and find out whether or not your name has any lineage to the slave owners back in the past. I know that mine does, Atkinson is a slave owner's name, so yeah. Um, just one last thing before I go, because I'm absolutely exhausted. Um, look at this. What the hell is this?